China, numbers matter. They can symbolize luck or life, loneliness or death. Some are politically sensitive. They usually involve dates, like 10:359, the day the ultimately unsuccessful Tibetan uprising against Chinese rule began. Then there are the numbers that can land you in jail if you post about them online, like 64 and 89. They stand for June 4th, 1989, the date of the Tiananmen Square massacre. For a long time, Hong Kong was the only place in China where you could commemorate the significance of that day. Hong Kongers could show films about the students and workers that protested in central Beijing for weeks to demand democratic reforms. They could tweet that iconic picture of a single defiant man standing in front of a tank, and they could hold a candlelit vigil each anniversary to remember the hundreds, perhaps thousands, of people who were killed by the Chinese military as they crushed the peaceful demonstrations. That is until Beijing banned the vigil. Jasmine Leung is our Hong Kong journalist on the ground who's been working with us on this podcast. On June fourth, twenty twenty one, she went down to Victoria Park, where people normally gather every year to remember those who died. But this year, the event was deemed illegal. We are seeing an empty basketball court without light this year, and we are not seeing hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong people attending the vigil.、Uh, there are also a lot of policemen over there. And some of the people who want to mourn the event handed out leaflets and electronic candlelights to pedestrians. For the second year running, the government said it was to prevent the spread of COVID, but no one really bought it. Authorities had threatened five years in jail for anyone who turned up holding a candle and wearing black. Why black? To commemorate Tiananmen deaths. And it was also the color favored by pro-democracy protesters in 2019. Still, a couple of hundred people defied the police, came out anyway, and just walked around the park. <laughs> Official social distancing warnings mingled with occasional pro-democracy chants. Instead of candles, some people turned on the lights on their phones. Jasmine spoke with a few of them. I just talked to a woman who refused to be identified.、Uh, she was just being warned by the police just by putting down flowers to mourn the dead, and she was very afraid and she felt very ridiculous that the government would take the action. It's a probability for her to be arrested because she dressed in black today, and I can see some youngsters dressed in black and with a black cap and a black mask. And he was being stopped and searched by the police. The Tiananmen Square crackdown in 1989 marked a crossroads in China's history. It was when Beijing chose order and stability over freedom and human rights, and the world knew it. Three decades later, Beijing may not be sending tanks into Hong Kong, but it is once again making the same decision to shut things. Down. I forewarn those radicals not to attempt to violate this law because the consequences are very serious. People are being arrested and journalists are being oppressed. The threat is very real. You never know who will report you, who will denounce you. Such a beautiful and wonderful city being dismantled by this terrible regime just for their obsession on power, total control. It was traumatic. A lot of people were scarred by that, and I was one of them. For those who tasted police brutality, for those who sniffed tear gas, they will come back, and people will rise again in the future. I'm Sophia Yan, China correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, and you're listening to Hong Kong Silenced, a show about a city turned upside down. One of 
the few places that people were able to gather to remember the Tiananmen Square crackdown was in church. Many Hong Kongers follow traditional Eastern religions, Buddhism, Taoism. But the city also has a well-established Christian community, a legacy of British colonial rule. And these Christians were involved in the pro-democracy protests of 2019. They inspired people to sing the hymn Hallelujah and sheltered protesters escaping tear gas and rubber bullets. A few hundred older churchgoers even banded together, acting as a physical barrier to prevent too much violence and provide Christian charity to those who needed it. They called themselves Protect the Children. Pastor Roy Chan was one of them. I'm the founder of Good Neighbor North District Church in Hong Kong. The church I have a big participation in the social movement at last two years. We are volunteer. We are the Yellow West. Some of us over 60s or maybe 80 something. We go to the front line in the protest to do some buffering work between the policemen and the young people. We will talk about the Bible to the policemen. For example, we wanted to persuade the policemen don't hit the young, young people brutally. Freedom of religion has always been protected in Hong Kong. That's a stark contrast to mainland China, where religious minorities have long been persecuted and tightly controlled. The reason? China fears these groups will threaten its legitimacy by pulling loyalty away from the Communist Party. Think the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhists, now in exile. Or Uyghur Muslims, imprisoned for praying at home. By summer 2021, that logic was starting to be applied to Christians in Hong Kong, too. Vatican-employed nuns were being arrested. Beijing was trying to choose the city's next bishop. Pastors were censoring sermons for anything overtly political. Seems like some people say something right, I will threaten you. What the pastor or maybe bishop, they need to be very careful about what they say. Seems like the freedom of the, the religious and what they preaching become deteriorate. Some churches were raided and had their assets frozen. And that's exactly what happened to Pastor Chan. The government alleged money laundering and fraud. He denies the charges and says it was political. Afraid of being arrested under the national security law, Pastor Chan chose to flee Hong Kong. He now lives in the UK with his family, but keeps in contact with his former congregation. Many, though, are too scared to talk to him openly, partly because the case is ongoing. Those who do are worried that, just like in mainland China, their freedom of religion is slipping away. And also they feel very disappointed, seems hopeless. This is a very dilemma uh, feeling. God always tells we have the hope in his kingdom. But in the situation in Hong Kong, the white terror, they feel afraid. They feel feared about it. We need to be strong in the darkness time. Other parts of Hong Kong were also feeling the walls closing in including in the arts. First, a major new art museum decided against showing a famous photograph of dissident Chinese artist Ai Weiwei flipping a middle finger in Tiananmen Square. The same happened to the documentary feature Inside the Red Brick Wall, about the siege of Pali Yu, a violent 13-day standoff between protesters and police in 2019. Shot by an anonymous collective, it was pulled before its highly anticipated March 2021 premiere in the city. Crowds had lined up to buy advance tickets. Tickets the cinema was forced to refund. Also axed? Raise the Umbrellas, a film about pro-democracy protests in 2014 by acclaimed Hong Kong director Evans Chan. As was Do Not Split, an American-Norwegian documentary short nominated for an Oscar, where young protesters in 2019 were free to say what they wanted, very free. Now I find it, it's really, maybe for something I cannot really say, for example, you know, fuck China, 
maybe I can say it today, but I'm afraid I cannot say it tomorrow. Then the bombshell. June 2021, the government announced that censors would bar all films deemed to endanger national security. Imagine the lights going out on set. It was a wrap for Hong Kong's storied film industry, the one that for decades gave the world kung fu flicks and noirish romances. The message to avoid anything even remotely political couldn't have been clearer. What came next snuffed out any remaining dreams of democracy, a new requirement that only patriots could run or hold office. I'm going to bring back my colleague Nicholas Smith, the Telegraph's Asia correspondent. We've covered the story together a lot. Nikki, tell us about the impact of these changes. The changes aim to keep people that China deems to be unpatriotic from positions of political power. That means that if you have views that oppose the Chinese Communist Party, then you won't be able to sit in the parliament. And who exactly is in charge of picking out who will be a patriot? The plan is to have a pro-China panel or election committee that would vet and elect candidates. And their job would be to weed out any views that the Communist Party doesn't like. It sounds kind of like having Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the UK, or perhaps the queen, deciding who can run for local council elections in cities like Cambridge or Leeds. Yes, it does. And can you imagine the outrage that that would provoke in the UK if that happened? This whole system makes a mockery of the idea of democratic elections. There were barely any pro-democracy politicians left. Many were behind bars and others had fled into exile. But these latest changes meant it would be impossible for anyone who disagreed with Beijing to get into LegCo, let alone consider running. Letitia Wong is a pro-democracy local councillor. They would just let their people to participate. They won't let others to run. This is a game that they are demonstrating that Hong Kong still have some kind of democracy, but the true Hong Kong people would not see it that way. And the warning bells just kept coming. Apple Daily, Hong Kong's most popular tabloid newspaper, was targeted again. Nikki, can you tell us what happened? This was the second time that Apple Daily was raided. The first, if you remember, was in 2020, and that's when they arrested founder Jimmy Lai. They paraded him through the newsroom. And this latest raid was even bigger. 500 police officers stormed the newsroom. They went to the homes of at least seven editors and executives and arrested them. And they froze the company's assets. Uh, What does this tell you, you think, Nikki, in terms of what this means for the press in Hong Kong? The Apple Daily was known as a fiercely independent newspaper. It was often critical of Beijing. It often pushed back against what it perceived to be Chinese authoritarianism in Hong Kong. And the fact that it was the first newspaper that was targeted sent a message to other media that this kind of dissent would no longer be tolerated and that it would provoke serious consequences. It was a blatant attack on press freedom. And so all of this meant that a week after this second raid on Apple Daily, the 26-year-old paper closed down. Jasmine, our journalist in Hong Kong, was there the night the paper printed its last edition. We're having around 50 to 60 people outside uh, Apple Daily building. They're holding umbrellas and in the rain and chanting, we support Apple Daily to the end, take care Apple Daily, we support the Mirai, and people are waving their flashlights on their phones, and actually staff from the rooftop are reacting as well. And they are also saying, thank you, readers, thank you, Jimmy Lai, and we will meet very soon. 
In a letter from jail, Jimmy later wrote, The The era era is is falling falling apart apart before before us, and it it is time time for us to stand stand tall. Freedom Freedom of speech is a dangerous dangerous job. job. But the clearest sign yet of just how much freedom had disappeared came in late June 2021, just as the first anniversary of the national security law drew closer. The trial of Tong Ing Kit. The 24-year-old is accused of riding his motorcycle into police officers while carrying an illegal protest banner. Tong's case was still ongoing when we recorded this in early July 2021. Hong Kong was well known for robust rule of law with a system based on English common law. But Nikki, Tong's trial marked a change. Can you explain why he was arrested? So he's been accused of terrorism for the crash and incitement to commit secession for the slogan. And he also faces separate charges of dangerous driving. With all of this, if he's convicted, he could be facing life in jail. And Tong has pleaded not guilty. So Tong's case was interesting because he was arrested for activities perpetrated on the first day that the national security law was in place. And he's also the first case now to go to trial under the national security law, right, Nikki? That's right. It's a landmark case, and people are watching it very closely to see how it plays out. Despite protests from his defence team and the potentially harsh sentence that he's facing, he won't have a jury in his trial, and he's only going to have three judges who are appointed by the government. The national security law has basically taken down the, the legal firewall between Hong Kong system and China. So this case is a massive test of how the judicial system in Hong Kong will interpret and enforce the law. And it's also going to offer a clear sign of how far the law will go in terms of criminalising political speech. This is a system that's starting to sound a lot more like what you see in mainland Chinese courts. In China, courts have a 99.9% conviction rate. And that's a consequence of how much control the party has over the country's legal and judicial system. And that's something that seems to be now coming to Hong Kong under the national security law. Exactly. The worry is whether three judges who've been appointed by the government on such a politically sensitive case can really remain impartial. For Albert Ho, the veteran lawyer and pro-democracy activist, the pressure for judges to toe the party line is growing. You cannot expect that all the judges would be firm and courageous enough to stand against all this pressure. But I'm still hopeful that uh, we were able to, to maintain certain basic standards and decency in our justice system. Shortly after we spoke, Albert was sentenced to 18 months for organizing an unauthorized assembly, i.e. a protest the government didn't approve. It's not his first jail term, and he'd been expecting it. I'm still prepared to sacrifice my freedom to enable the people to speak out. And the people did speak out. I will continue to be hopeful. I will continue to fight for what we believe in. I will stand with the Hong Kong people who are peace-loving for the future of Hong Kong. By June 30th, 2021, after exactly a year of the national security law, Hong Kong was a different place. Now, the big question on everyone's mind was, what next? Coming up after the break. I think there is definitely a possibility for mass uprising in the future, given that how repressive the Chinese Communist Party had been behaving. Don't go away. Hi, my name's Theodora Leloudis. I'm the Telegraph's podcast editor, which means I pretty much get to listen to things like the show you're listening to all day on work time. But it also means that I get to commission podcasts like Hong Kong Silence, shows which shine a light on human rights issues and very real threats to democracy. And putting together shows like this one takes a team of journalists, and that's where our subscribers come in. Without their support, we wouldn't have the funds to make journalism like this. 
To become one of them and to get unlimited access to all of The Telegraph's journalism across print, audio, video and beyond, head to telegraph.co.uk slash silenced where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online. And after that, it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash silenced or click on the link in the episode description. Inside a shiny skyscraper in Causeway Bay, a hotel has been converted for now into the new Office for Safeguarding National Security. Meanwhile, across Hong Kong's stunning harbor, a permanent location is being built. A looming, constant reminder of how different life is now. So what's changed for Hong Kongers a year into the national security law? Well, they can forget about mass protests against Beijing or running for parliament if they're not 100% loyal to the government. They can no longer buy a newspaper that challenges the government's policies, openly question the Chinese Communist Party in school, on social media, or at work, or commemorate controversial events in history that challenge the government's official narrative. Even those in exile aren't completely safe, The law actually applies globally, though it's unclear whether authorities will enforce it. More than 100 people were arrested during the first year under the law. Around 60 of them were formally charged. That might not seem like a lot in a city of over 7 million people, but it was enough to scare most into submission. And that's the aim. To silence an entire city. The immediate objective is to intimidate Hong Kong people and silence all the dissidents. Although many people are not directly affected, many of them felt terribly depressed and miserable having seen what is happening in Hong Kong. Beijing are using this law like holding a knife on the Hong Kong people's neck. And if you do something wrong and the government do not like it, they will use the NSL to punish you. People are being arrested and journalists are being oppressed. The threat is very real. Everyone must be very loyal, very close, and very supportive towards the government and towards the Beijing. I think the whole society just changed. You may not charge it directly by the national security law as a normal citizen, but your life is going to be affected by it. Hong Kong and loyal. Together we stand. Together we stand. The changes in Hong Kong are so dramatic that people like Nathan, Ted, Maggie, and many others have picked up in search of opportunity elsewhere, or are planning to. No one knows exact numbers, but Britain announced a new type of residency visa for Hong Kongers earlier this year, and more than 34,000 people applied in the first two months alone. A lot of people involved in the protests are not eligible, however. For those who have chosen to stay or aren't able to leave, life grinds on. Some have developed their own quiet ways of resisting Beijing. Like Christine, the civil servant who felt she had no choice but to sign the loyalty pledge. Like I might go to a restaurant that doesn't support the government or buy snacks from those yellow shops that supported the protest before. Those are the kind of little things that we can do at this stage. I did notice some colleagues have stickers on their desks, just little stickers that say something similar to that protest slogan. Five demands, not one less. But it's changed into another sentence, like five types of ingredients, not one less. In general, though, I feel like I'm not able to do much anymore after this national security law. You just feel like you're kind of like helpless. Many people have had to lower their expectations, their hopes. Like Letitia Wong, an ambitious young pro-democracy local councillor. After a year of harassment and legal threats, she resigned from her post in mid-June 2021. She didn't say why publicly, but she quit just before the loyalty pledge requirement kicked in. For now, she's staying in Hong Kong. She spoke to us before she resigned. 
we do know that after the NSL or after the reform of uh, election system, it would be very limited room or space to fight inside the institution. But we do hope Hong Kong people could still stand together, at least to go through this darkest time. I do believe that in future years in Hong Kong will be very tough times, but it is what we should face to fight for our freedom. Not everyone thinks that Hong Kong is in a downward spiral. On July 1st, 2021, the Chinese Communist Party celebrated its 100th birthday with a massive political spectacle. As part of it, leader Xi Jinping gave a lengthy speech. And of course, Hong Kong got a shout out. We will ensure social stability in Hong Kong and Macau and maintain lasting prosperity and stability in the two special administrative regions. No one should underestimate the resolve, the will, and the ability of the Chinese people to defend their national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Without the Communist Party of China, there would be no new China and no national rejuvenation. To Beijing, the national security law was necessary. Here's Regina Ip, a prominent politician in Hong Kong and a vocal supporter of the law. I think it will make sure we are safe, will make sure Hong Kong will not be a danger to mainland China. It would ensure law and order. I think it's all positive for Hong Kong. I think those who thought Hong Kong had died had an extreme view of freedoms. Maybe their idea of freedom is do what you will, but that's not the real concept of freedom. If everyone is allowed to do what he or she will, there will be no freedom left. Other Hong Kongers share this view. With something so polarizing, it's easy for both sides to demonize the other. But we're not talking about cartoon villains here. Some people just have different priorities. Across the city, those people have spent the last year chatting over meals about how they feel much safer now. Regular Hong Kongers, such as Mr. and Mrs. Leong, both in their 50s. Politics-wise, I think as long as people enjoy social stability and their lives are good, you know, people have money to buy stuff or for entertainment. I'm satisfied. I think being able to elect a leader is just like having a dessert. You won't die without it, but you cannot live without a proper job. Let's say you really follow democracy. What will happen to people's lives in the future? It's uncertain. I won't support their uncertainty for the youth who seek democracy and sacrifice the stability and livelihood I enjoy now. My social circle shares similar views to me. That means, no matter whether you oppose the government, the way you express yourself should not affect other citizens. We cannot care too much about politics. The responsibility for all of that falls to the government. And this is the kind of thinking the Chinese Communist Party likes. The party has always done everything in its power to ensure its 1.4 billion citizens either support it or shut up. And thanks to the national security law, Hong Kongers are no longer exempt. Remember the one country, two systems arrangement put in place for 50 years when Britain handed the colony back to China in 1997? Two Systems was the foundation of the city's pro-democracy movement. But for Beijing, 
The one country bit, that was far more important, and thus the permanent reality. Regina Ip again. We have two systems under the sovereignty of China. If your political position is to object to anything to do with Beijing, you are not really upholding the basic law. You are not helping. That's the problem. Eventually, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau will all be brought under the fold. Of course, Taiwan is resisting, but the idea is reunification. It's not to grant Hong Kong and Macau a high level of autonomy. I think some Western leaders, for political reasons, have been distorting this concept. Beijing's take is my house, my rules. Anything it does in Hong Kong, Macau, or even Taiwan is its own business because those places belong to China. But Western nations see it differently. This law risks seriously undermining the high degree of autonomy of Hong Kong. Is being used to stifle dissent, not to improve. We have indeed security. consistently said that China would risk very negative consequences if, if it went clear ahead with this. and serious breach. Of the Sino On British Hong Kong, I'm concerned about the rapidly shrinking civic and democratic space. Mine's the one country, two systems framework. China's reputation, public base. perception we in Hong Kong, to and the To the international community, Hong Kong signifies what's at stake: a clash between Western and Chinese political systems and values. There have been some sanctions by the U.S. Heavy condemnation by the UK, alarm expressed by the UN. Some think it was too little, too late. But this is where activists and politicians in exile hope they can turn the tide back. After fleeing Hong Kong just days before the national security law came in, activist Nathan Law now lives in London. He spends his days advocating for Hong Kong. My daily life is surrounded by、um, interviews, conferences, meetings. As long as there are opportunities for me to speak up for Hong Kong to communicate with policymakers, then I'll be there. With friends and colleagues arrested and jailed, Nathan feels fortunate in many ways. He escaped, but it also means he's far from family, confidants, and his two rescue cats, and he's wanted by the Chinese state. Yeah, I, I I don't feel safe at all. But、um, you could always see how extensive China's reach could be. Extraterritorial threats and intimidation are omnipresent. Luckily, I am not being physically assaulted or encounter any like suspicious、um, accidents. What do you miss most about Hong Kong? Well, basically everything is. The place that I default myself into, I will work all my life for its liberty and its freedom. Sometimes just little things. Sometimes just when you are waiting in a bus stop and surrounded with background noise of Cantonese, you can never experience the same thing elsewhere from the world, and you realize that you just can't go back. Yeah, so it's it's difficult. Even for Nathan, an activist since his late teens, the scale and pace of changes in Hong Kong have been unfathomable. For anyone who loves this whirlwind of a city, the chaos, the cacophony, the energy, the rate at which it was silenced was difficult to bear. I think there are lots of signs showing that the deterioration in Hong Kong is kind of like inevitable. But also the speed of that caught everyone off guard, and we didn't really think that the Beijing government would push so far, turning Hong Kong into just ordinary Chinese city without any trace of、uh, autonomy. And yet he remains optimistic. I think there is definitely a possibility for a mass uprising in the future, given that how repressive. The Chinese Communist Party had been behaving, so、um, always hopeful on that. Politician Ted Huay, also now in exile, feels the same. Even though now it's it's over, it still gives me 
the hope. I felt more hopeful because I could see that people are so awake and now they believe that they see the real nature of CCP, of the Hong Kong regimes, that they are just liars. So they will do whatever they can to be resistant and to be in opposition. I believe that more people are in the club now and they will be fighting on no matter what. For those who tasted police brutality, for those who sniffed tear gas and all different kinds of weapons, saw the life uh, on TV, how people were treated brutally by the police, they wouldn't forget, I'm sure. And they will come back and people will rise again in the future. We lost our opportunity but we haven't lost hope. After reuniting with his family, Ted eventually moved to Australia, where he hopes to spread the fight for Hong Kong further afield. These days, he no longer worries about people following him, being pepper sprayed, or those dawn police raids that terrified his kids. Like Nathan, he campaigns tirelessly about Hong Kong, writing comment pieces, lobbying MPs. When I asked him what he misses about his home city, he said it wasn't the food or the culture. Not yet, anyway. I would say that I missed the moment when we lived in freedom, when I marched with more than a million people. Even at the most intense moments, the moment I stood between the riot police and protesters, and the moment I spent in Polytechnic University, those moments even was intense, it was cruel, but I felt that it was our freedom, that people were powerful. So that's the thing I missed most, because that's the thing that we lost. The ability to march en masse may be lost, but the things that Hong Kongers saw and experienced continue to live on in the city today. The memories of those intoxicating and often violent months in 2019 haunt the streets, hanging like ghosts over whole neighborhoods. I went to a concert at the Hong Kong Coliseum. But you know, when you go to a concert, you are supposed to be happy. But when you pass by Pauli Yu and you go near Hong Kong Station, every time you, you visit that place, that area, and all the things that happened on, on those days, you will see all these flashbacks. You will see everything that happened on those days. For Sarah, the young protester who lives with her mother, the demonstrations were a crucible moment. In that struggle for democracy, for freedom, it's not finished. We believe we started something in 2019. Maybe that part of the resistance is over. But I've always believed that whoever that has participated in the movement in 2019, they wouldn't just forget what happened. I'm one of them. And I believe a lot of my friends share the same thought. We haven't improved our situation. We failed to do that. But I believe that we started something and that thing is still alive. I would say we have built a foundation of any future resistance movement. And that's what matters. Although they can't chant slogans or post about it on social media, she and her friends continue to carve out space to push back against Beijing wherever they can. She feels awake, as Ted put it. It's not like you stop people from speaking. It doesn't mean that it's over, right? That the same beliefs or the same thoughts, it exists people, and there's no way to stop it. Still, Sarah is pessimistic, or perhaps realistic, about what Hong Kong is facing in the coming years. I think, like, the national security law, it, it will only expand. The law will become a, a monster. It's already a, a mini monster. 
right now maybe it only affect like the pro democracy peeps, but then after that, like maybe people who don't care about the politics, even the people who support the government, maybe they don't realize it right now, but it will affect everyone, I believe. She can already see it affecting the people around her. She's trying to hang on even as friends and family make plans to leave. Whatever happens, no matter how, how bad things will be in Hong Kong, at least I'm here to, to go through all that with the people I care about. But then, that's my current thoughts. If things really get much worse or it becomes like unbearable, then maybe one day I will leave Hong Kong. I hope I don't have to go. Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong is nearly complete. Two paths now lie before Hong Kongers who disagree with it. Stay silent or get out. It's not an easy choice. And who knows where either path might lead. You've been listening to Hong Kong Silenced with me, Sophia Yan, China correspondent for The Telegraph. This show was reported by me and Nicholas Smith. It was written and produced by Venetia Rainey and produced and sound designed by Leanne Coyle at Whistledown Productions, with additional audio gathering and translation by Jasmine Leung. The commissioning editors are Theodora Leloudis and Jess Winch. Follow this feed on your podcast app to make sure you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the series, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find this show. A special thanks to all the Hong Kongers who took a risk by speaking with us. It isn't easy to tell your story, to relive some of those moments, and we're grateful you trusted us. (laughs) 